praise Him, amen, and I will sing to Him a new song, amen, hallelujah, 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 I will sing to Him a new song, hallelujah, 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 I will sing to Him a new song. Celebrate, amen. Sing unto the Lord, and I will sing to him a new song. I will celebrate, amen. Sing unto the Lord, and I will sing to him a new song. Jesus, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. And what an awesome God we serve, huh? Mm, what an awesome God we serve in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. So glad to be in the house of the Lord. You can be seated for just a few minutes or however long it takes, whatever. Um, I just want to make this announcement right away so that I don't know if you can switch your plans, but if you haven't had, if you don't have plans for for um, for lunch, um, uh, there's a group back there that's in the process of making um, what I would consider a good summer lunch for you: brats and German potato salad and potato chips and beans and just all the stuff that we kind of like at the summertime. And so we're planning on doing that. It's kind of a fundraiser that we do. Uh, we do charge for this. It's $10 for adults and, and $5 for children under 12. I know that's a little bit uh, pricey, but um, when you compare to what you'd have to pay somewhere else, it's probably not. So, And plus, it's for a good cause. And so always keep that in mind, and so um, consider that. And so that'll happen after the service this morning, somewhere probably around the 12 or the 11.45 um, hour is when we're going to probably start feeding if everything goes the way it's supposed to go. If it doesn't, then we'll just <laughs> we'll do it when it happens. Then. But um, that's after the service this morning and, of course, services tonight and uh, just lots of good things happening. Let me give you a praise report. Um, we had a, a, a very urgent and special prayer for one of our pastors up in uh, the northeastern uh, part of uh, Montana, Brother Steve Haig. 
Um, he fell off of a, of a roof uh, 21 feet into the ground and, um, and, and busted himself up pretty good. And, um, of course, everybody was anxious and, you know, why didn't God stop that? Well, he could have, but he didn't, and so we accept that. And um, he went to the hospital, been in the hospital now for about the last week, talked to him yesterday, um, and you talk about a guy that was motivated and, and high-spirited for the Lord. And you know what he, so he told me, and I've, or I've learned this. He said, Brother Carnahan, I want to tell you right now, he said, this could have been a lot worse. And I will say that. You know, sometimes when God doesn't keep us from all of the impact, and sometimes he doesn't. He just doesn't. I don't know why. He just doesn't. I do understand that he, it could have been a lot worse. And that's what he said. And so he's hoping to get out of the hospital Tuesday and go home. He's got a little bit of a recovery time, um, but he is doing good well. And um, he knows that the Lord is on the throne, and that's what's so important in Jesus' name. And so if you think about it, you think about, you think about the Hegg family. Um, just mention that in prayer and give God thanks. It was God is his mercy is really 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 awesome, isn't it? Praise God. And so that's what's going on in the district. Lots of other things going on. We had a men's retreat down in Green River this week, and just general conferences coming up. We have a youth convention coming. Just lots of stuff going on. And so keep an eye on that calendar out there. We have a calendar that we print once a month and try to put everything that we know of on there and so that you'll be aware of things in Jesus' name. Um, we're going to look at, um, again today, we're going to be involved in what we call the Discipleship Project. And um, again, this has been take, this take, has taken a little bit of a, of a different direction than what I'm used to doing, but that's okay. Um, and, um, and we're doing a little more teaching on Sunday mornings than we are preaching, although we do mix it in. Can somebody say amen? And so um, this morning will be no different. Uh, there'll be some things on the screen that you're going to want to pay attention with. Also, if you brought your books with you, if you have one of these books, and I think we have one left up here. If anybody doesn't have one, we have one book left. And so um, why don't you be in charge of that one book? Charge a charge million dollars for it. No, I'm just kidding. Last one, yeah, last one. But this book here is what we're working out of on a regular basis, and hopefully you will get used to that. One of the things that I, I am very concerned about in my own life, I've always been concerned this way, is that a lot of times I can hear things. I can, I can understand things. But the, the idea of it is, is that sometimes I lose them. I lose it. You know, a day or so later I'm going, well, what was that, you know? It's like years ago, you know, when, and I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. And one of the gifts of the Spirit is something called diverse tongues. And sometimes that diverse tongue will be a tongue that needs to be interpreted. And we have that happen on a fairly regular basis around here in this church. But sometimes what we do is we get caught up in the euphoria or the emotion of it, and we forget what's been said. You know, I've done that. I've gone out of the, come out of the prayer room or come out of a hot service, and, and man, just God was moving, wasn't he? And then somebody will say, well, what did he say? And I'm going, boy, I forgot. And so this is one of the reasons why we're, we're trying to employ these books here is that you can write some things down, and hopefully then you won't forget them. Or at least you can got a way or a method in which you can remind yourself. Now, if you weren't here last week, we started this, and it was called the Discipleship Project, and we talked about the big idea last week, and I don't know if you remember that or not, but let me just remind you of this. The big idea last week was, since Jesus is calling all of us to ongoing discipleship, which is a call that Jesus gives to us, we, you and I, should accept that invitation. And so hopefully that's something you've been thinking about, also in those booklets that you have, you have um, uh, daily reminders that you can engage yourself with. And so I want to I wanna just help you and not, you know, tell you you better or, or else. I'm just saying these are just things that you could do that maybe will help you, you know, to begin to, um, to uh, get involved in the discipleship project. Because whether you know this or not, in the scripture, that was a mandate that Jesus gave to his disciples. After they became disciples, he said, you go into the world and make disciples of other men. 
And so this is what's happening in the world that you and I are living in, and we have that opportunity. So we're going to be working with this booklet, and then there will be some things on the screen here that hopefully you will um, uh, begin to see and that type of thing. And so as soon as I get myself engaged here a little bit, we'll go ahead and we'll move on. Somebody say the Discipleship Project. Okay, all right. And the scripture that we're going to be looking at today in particular to begin this and there's going to be three ingredients. I'm just going to kind of let a little bit of the cat out of the bag here. Uh, towards the end of this lesson, there are going to be three ingredients that you're going to want to write down and you're going to want to think about for your own personal life. Three things that will help you to get involved, in my opinion, in the discipleship project, praise God. And so consider that. There will be three specific things that you will want to not forget, praise God. But in the beginning here, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 16. And I'm going to begin reading there in verse um, uh, number, um, number 15. And this is a very, very instrumental chapter in the Bible. And it's because Jesus is beginning not only to um, reassure that these disciples that have been following him for a while know who he is, but he's going to begin to allow them to know what is the mission here. See, you've got to understand, up to this time, you know, Jesus has been doing a lot of miracles. Jesus has been performing, and, and just, I mean, the whole area knew about him. And unfortunately, there were some people that got upset. I've seen that happen before. You know, God will do something great for somebody, and everybody should be rejoicing. Everybody should be happy about it. But there's a few people that will sit back and get mad about it. And it's like, get mad of God doing some good things? I, you know, I don't have it figured out either. But that's just how it works, praise God. But let's see if I can get this thing to work here. Ah, look at that. It works, praise God. We're going to go to number three. Yes, Matthew chapter number 15. Or I'm sorry, chapter number 16 in verse number 15. And let me read this for you. The Bible says, he said unto them, this is Jesus, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. That was his full name, apparently. The son of John is who he was. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you. It says, but my Father which is in heaven, the Spirit of God is in charge of revelation. And then it was, goes on to say in verse 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, what he just got done knowing and saying, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail or succeed against it. I've said this for years, it's not like they won't try, but they'll never succeed. Now, when we talk about those three ingredients later on in this lesson, this is going to be very important because it is not the will of God for Satan to succeed in anybody's life. Never, ever has been. Okay, and also verse 19, look at this, we're still in the 16th chapter of Matthew, verse 19, and I, who's going to be the giver? Don't forget that. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. A very, very, very important principle. The principle of binding and loosing. I've been doing a little personal study here lately about curses. Because there's some things that that just don't figure out in my brain. And so I've been going into the Word of God and studying some things, and I found some interesting facts about curses. Maybe someday I'll share them with you. Quite a deal, folks. There's a lot of folks, in my opinion, that I can see now are living with a little bit of a curse in their life. And it was of God. God put a curse on the earth, you know. He said, weeds are going to start growing, things like that. But consider that, binding and loosing. And then the Bible says, then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was the son of, or that he was Jesus the Christ, which would have been a real hard thing to do. You ever have Jesus do something for you and you want to tell everybody? Well, sure, that's kind of a natural thing. Well, at this point in time, Jesus was saying, don't tell anybody. And then in verse 21, 
I'll just continue on here. It says, from that time forth. Now, here's what I want you to see. It says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go on to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. The plan, not only who Jesus is, was, and always will be, but the plan is being revealed. And that's important. Discipleship will help you not only to know who Jesus is, it'll get you closer to him, but it'll begin to help you to see his plan. There's so many people today that are, and I, and I use this very, very uh, carefully, but are ignorant of the plan of God. That God's main goal is not for you to have all kinds of things and prosper and all of these, this business down here. His major goal is for you to be saved. Remember last week, students? We talked about one of the things that we must receive. The invitation is the invitation of the gospel message. And do you remember how we respond to that gospel message? Come on, we respond through repentance. Baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. And then the gift of the Holy Ghost is brought into our lives. And so this is a response. God wants us to learn to respond to his plan. And God's plan is the gospel. And so Jesus is trying to help them to understand that that gospel message is going to be fulfilled or played out right in front of their eyes. They're going to literally see him be crucified, buried, and raised again. But watch the response here. And this is where we get really sideways with God sometimes. We don't want that to happen. We want the Disney version. We want this to be happy, happy all the time. And you must understand that all things together work for good. And so what happens is we got somebody who's a disciple who wants to kind of take charge over this. And I'll show you how he takes charge. The Bible says, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that, I wouldn't have stood too close to him when he did that. But it's the, it's the bottom line. It happened. Come on, it's in the scripture. And so you and I must understand you know, he said, this shouldn't happen this way. Be this far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. And you know, Jesus did a little rebuking here too, didn't he? I'm going to guarantee you, if you're a disciple for very long, you're probably going to get caught up in this a little bit. You're going to, I'm going to be rebuked of the Lord sometimes. And it's not like he puts us down so we can't get up again. It's just that sometimes we really don't know who he is sometimes and we don't know his plan. And that's what he's trying to help us with. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. There's the crux of the matter. You don't have to be an ugly devil not to be living for God. Sometimes you can just insert your own will. And that can be the thing that can keep God from doing what he wants to do in your life. Remember I told you, one of the principles that we just saw here, binding and loosing. God gives us the power to do that. You can begin to bind the things of God in your life or you can begin to loose and God wants to help us. And then in verse 24, I'll stop here with the scripture reading, then said Jesus unto his disciples, and you're going to find this often in the scripture, you're going to find that Jesus was able to say things to his disciples that he did not say to the crowd. He didn't say to the multitude. That's why I want to reemphasize last week. It's important for you to really consider taking that invitation to receive discipleship from God and then to begin to do something about it. It's going to be very important for you if you want to get a hold of this. And so the Bible says, Then Jesus said unto disciple, if, disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We could do other reading here, but I'll stop there. There's the, 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 the prerequisite, or I should say there's the minimum requirements. If you want to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, which I do hope you do, then you're going to have to learn how to deny yourself. You're going to have to learn how to take up your cross, my cross, 
and we're going to have to learn how to follow him every day, not just when things get bad, not just when the world, you know, implodes or explodes, but what we can learn to follow him every day in Jesus' name. And so imagine the disciples. You know, these guys have been following Jesus for a while, and things are just hopping and popping. You know, prior to this, these, these chapters, you're going to see where Jesus fed the multitude, took five loaves, began to break them apart, and fed, you know, some uh, theologians say conservatively close to 15,000 people. Five loaves and two fishes. Oh, we like that one, don't we? That's a good one. Let's have that one happen every day. Well, it didn't happen every day, but it did happen. And it happened because Jesus was in the, in the process of showing people that he was from God, and he was God. And so you think about that. But look in your booklets there, and you can write some things down if you want to here, but there's some questions there I want you to consider. Why do you think or why do you suppose that King Herod was jealous or suspicious of Jesus? Isn't that amazing? I mean, Jesus, did, he wasn't running for office. He wasn't trying to get into his political area, but Herod, was a, he was afraid of him. And so, you know, we think about that, and you're going to probably encounter people that have that spirit, that, you know, they're jealous and suspicious of Jesus. I've got my own little ideas. One of them is I think a lot of folks like to be on the throne. Okay? And then number two there, I'm talking about some questions that you can ask yourself or you can write these down. Why do you think the Pharisees and the religious leaders hated Jesus? Why did they have such a problem with Jesus? Again, all he was trying to do was good. You know, one of the reasons I think these questions are important is because maybe you can find out some of the things in your life that maybe is holding you back. We talked about this Wednesday night. I think there's some things that hold us back, and God wants to begin to reveal those things. One of my prayers this morning was, God, get the beam out of my eye, my eye, so that I can see what you want me to see. And I believe that the Lord can help us with that. And then, how would you have advised Jesus if you knew he was going to go like Peter? What would you have done if you would have been in Peter's spot? You know what I think? Come on. I think we probably might have done the same thing. Oh, Jesus. Don't go there. Let's keep this, this, this healing and this, you know, providing for all the, the hungry stuff going. And you know something, folks, that's why I'm saying we have to be careful with this kind of stuff because, you know, one, one of the things that Jesus was trying to do was not only, not only help them to understand who he is, but he was trying to help them to understand what he was all about. And so consider these things, okay? And, you know, do you have any idea, the, fo the fourth question there, do you have any idea what people around you, not here in this church, not just here, but the folks that you work with, what do they think of Jesus? Have you ever asked them? Have you ever started a conversation with somebody saying, you know, what do you think of this Jesus? Well, consider that, because the only way you're ever going to really know how people feel about this is by asking. And then the last question for right now is how can we live? How can we do this? How can we live in a way that portrays Jesus to the world as he truly is. Paul said in the 11th chapter of the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, he said, follow me as I follow Jesus. I think there's a key right there. I think one of the ways that we can portray Jesus in this world is by following him, making a daily effort that I am going to put Jesus into my life and I believe that God's smart enough through you to reveal some things to people around you. So consider these things. See, discipleship is that, denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following Jesus. Think about these things. And so I believe that God can give us great understanding. In fact, I believe that the Lord wants to give us great understanding. Look at what it says here. If I can get this thing. Oh, wrong button. There we go. In, in, John, or in Matthew chapter 16 and verse number 16, Jesus, or the Bible says there, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was a good answer. He knew who Jesus is and was in Jesus' name. 
And so I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe it's important for us to begin that relationship and establish that relationship and maintain that relationship in Jesus' name. Again, verse number 17. What was Jesus' response to Peter's response? Do you see the first word there? Blessed. Come on, look at somebody and say, blessed. If you know who Jesus Christ is, you are blessed in Jesus' name. In fact, I feel like we just need to lift up our hands right now, and we need to thank the Lord, amen, that we know who he is. If you don't know who he is, I believe that he can reveal it to you in just seconds in Jesus' name. Who he is. He is the king of kings, praise God. He is the king of kings. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad that I know who he is. Praise God. Come on, folks. I'm here to tell you that's the greatest revelation, in my opinion, that anybody can receive in this life is who Jesus is. Praise God. Now, look at this next slide up here. You know what Jesus did for Peter? Notice in verse number six, or chapter 16 and verse 18 and 19. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, he sh or I'm sorry, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You know what Jesus gave Simon? You can write this down. He gave him a name change. Praise God. And I'm glad for that. Praise God. Names are important. You know, we don't think about it now because a lot of the things that we do today are based upon fads. They're based upon popularity. They're based upon all kinds of things. But you know what the word Peter means? Yeah, it doesn't mean just a rock. It means a small rock. What was God trying to tell Peter? He was trying to say, you might be a rock, Peter, but you're not the rock. Come on, I'm here to tell you, friend, that's what we got to get down sometimes is that we know who the rock is, praise God. His name is Jesus. That's why that revelation of who he is is so very, very, very important. And I'm going to tell you something, my friends. you got to understand in this context of Scripture, Jesus is revealing this to who? Come on, who are the people that are surrounded him right now? His disciples. That's why discipleship is important. It's because what it does is it positions us in a place where God can begin to show us tremendous revelation. That's why the invitation that he extended to us last week is a very important one. Jesus is extending this invitation to everyone. And so you must understand, last week we talked about it, remember, how that immediately, right away, those disciples left what they were doing and began to follow Jesus. We also talked about the fact that, you know, God doesn't require that from everybody to quit their jobs, but he does require that they immediately begin to follow him. And so hopefully this last week, I'm talking about the week that's already passed, hopefully you've taken some opportunity to get close to the Lord and to follow him. Because when you begin to follow the Lord, praise God, you are going to begin to get some revelation. You're going to begin to get something revealed to you, and that is what is very, 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 very important in my opinion. Okay? Well, look at your, on your books again, and let's look at three other questions. And again, I'm not asking for your answers right now. I'm just asking you to consider these things. This is what might will help you to engage, okay? What, when have you ever felt the closest to the Lord? Can you remember a time when you thought, oh, my goodness, I didn't want to leave this place. I didn't want to leave this. You remember that? How many have ever felt, felt that way? Yeah, do you remember that? Well, I'm telling you something. File that away. Because I believe, man, praise God, God has in store for us to go down memory lane sometimes. Amen. And so think about that. You know, when, and you might want to write that down. Oh, it was during a church service. It was that time when I was in the prayer room. Or it was, you know, when we were doing this. Or maybe it was in a time when you were doing some fasting and praying. And maybe, I'll never forget, I had an, an, a tremendous experience myself, you know, in the church back in Dubuque, Iowa, that uh, a brother and I decided to go on a lengthy fast. And I'll never forget during the midst of that fast, I was in the, in the sanctuary and I was praying. And folks, I'll never forget that. I felt such a euphoria. I felt like I was literally in a heavenly place. 
And I never forgot that. Praise God. I never forgot that. God will help you, and he can lead you into those kind of things. The next question, what happened to bring you to that point? Well, I can tell you what brought me to that point is I wanted to become a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I began to follow him. And he led me into that place. He led me into a place where I began to deny myself through fasting, where I began to pick up the cross because it wasn't real pleasant to my flesh. But I began to follow him. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. It was exciting. Now, at this point in time, I want to tell you, I am nobody any more special than you are. All I did was learn to accept the invitation and to follow him in Jesus' name. This is what God has for each and every one of you in Jesus' name. Praise God. And the third question there, how long did you feel that close? Was it for a while? And what happened to make you realize that you had not arrived once and for all? What I mean, what it means by that, in my opinion, is that the only time that's ever going to happen or does that need to happen again and again and again and again? In my opinion, I believe it can. I believe that God wants to begin a pattern in your life where good things can begin to happen to you. And I believe that one of those things is all heading or, or upon the idea that he is the Christ in Jesus' name. And so Jesus gave Simon a, a, a name change. How come this thing is not working? Ah, there we are. Praise God. And I'm going to tell you something. He gave him some keys in Jesus' name. You follow that scripture, and I'm going to tell you something. You're going to feel something, praise God. But you know, like I told you before, there was something a little perplexing there. Jesus literally told the disciples not to tell anybody that he was the Christ. Amen. You know, I got my own little ideas about that, and I'll just share them with you. It might have been the fact that maybe they just couldn't explain it quite like he could. There's a lot of things when I first came into this thing that, you know, I, I tried to explain to people. I remember one time trying to, to explain the baptism of the Holy Ghost to somebody. And I was doing the best I could. But you know something? That person came out into the church after about two or three weeks, and they went down to the same altar that I went to, and they got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus did a whole lot better of explaining it than I did. You must understand, my friends, that's how God is. Now listen to me. It's not like you can't explain anything. But if you're going to really, really get close to the Lord, which I hope that is your desire, then I believe that God will begin to share things with you, and then I believe that you can begin to maybe share them with others. You must understand, it wasn't that Jesus didn't want anybody to know that he, know that he was the Christ, but my goodness, it sounded like Peter just got the plan all screwed up too, didn't he? And so we must understand, praise God, that God has his timing. And so he literally told his disciples not to tell anybody who he was, praise God. And then what happens here is something that I feel like is very, very important, praise God, is that Jesus wasn't just telling them who he was, but Jesus began to share with them, praise God, the plan, like I told you before, what was really going to happen. If you read those verses from verse number 20 through verse 22 there in the 16th chapter, chapter of Matthew, you will find out that Jesus began to explain to them exactly what was going to happen. You must understand, Jesus came into this world. He was born into this world, a natural way. But he came into this world with one huge task on his shoulders. And that task was to die for the sins of the world. That's what Jesus came primarily the first time for. And you know something that I found? I found that we sometimes get that messed up is that we want all the great things of God to happen to us this time around. And you must understand, just like Jesus, he was born to die. And you and I must recognize as true disciples, that's exactly what God has in store for us. That's why the Bible says if you want to be his true disciple, you have to learn to deny yourself. We talked about this last week in the idea of repentance. What does repentance mean? It means to begin to change the way we think. See, the problem here wasn't with Peter's, you know, desire to want to see God do great things. The, this, the real problem was is that God had to help him to change his way of thinking. 
And this is what I have discovered when it comes to true discipleship, is that we all have our ideas in the way it should be. We all have our ways and, you know, our, our, our ideas in the way it should be completed right now. But you know something? God has the plan. Come on, how many here right now can lift their hands right now and begin to say, God, I want to trust in your plan, not just in who you are, but in your plan. Come on, let's take about maybe 15 seconds right now, and let's reaffirm that in our own personal lives. Come on, I think this is very, very important. No, this isn't in the script, but I believe this is the will of God right now, that he's trying to help us not only to follow him, but to know his plan, and not only his plan, but his plan for you in the name of Jesus. That's it, Lord. God, I thank you that you came and died for the sins of the world. And now, Lord God, you're calling upon us to do the same thing. No, not to die for the sins of the world, but to die out to ourselves. And I help us, Lord Jesus. Help us to do that in the name of Jesus. And I give you the praise and I give you the glory in Jesus' name. What do you say we just thank the Lord together? Can we do that? Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And so I understand that Jesus, again, was trying to help them to realize that there was something a whole lot more at stake here than just, you know, their, their everything going well and feeding the multitudes and healing the sick and doing all of that. Listen to me, folks. I think those things are good. And I believe that there's a lot of that kind of thing that goes on in the world that you and I live in. But you must understand something. Healing never saved anybody. The blood of Jesus Christ is what saves people. People, praise God. The realization that he is God and he died for the sins of the world so that you and I could have hope in the name of Jesus. Listen to me, folks. This is one of the principles of discipleship is that you and I not only know who Jesus is, but we understand his plan. Because you must understand, if we're going to follow Jesus, the plan that Jesus followed is going to be the, about the same that's going to be in our lives. And so I see a lot of people, in my opinion, that make that big mistake that God is this huge Santa Claus up there, that he's just going to provide everything great in my life. Well, listen to me, folks. Just like Brother Steve Haig told me, he said it could have been a whole lot worse, praise God. I'm going to tell you something right now. That's the way it is in this life. Without God, I'm going to tell you something. There is no hope in the name of Jesus. And so you and I must understand that through discipleship, through following Jesus Christ, that God can begin to reveal to us what his plan is. Not only his plan, but his plan for you in, his, in your life in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? I'll tell you, I'm so, so, so glad. But you know, just like Peter, as I said before, we sometimes have good intentions. We have things that the way we think they should be. And that's exactly what Peter began to do. He began to say, Lord, that's not how it should work. That's not how this should go. And so you must understand, this is what I see myself doing sometimes. That's why praying and, and, and being with the Lord and those three ingredients, I'm going to introduce them to you here in just a second, praise God. These three ingredients are going to be very important for us to keep in the plan of God, praise God, because I believe that's what God wants to do in Jesus' name, praise God. And so we must understand that there came a time in this that, 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 that Jesus had to do something to Peter. And believe me, I've learned that uh, you've got to let the Lord do this sometimes with people. But the Bible says that Jesus rebuked Peter. You know, the Scripture says this. Listen to me now. This isn't in your script, but you might want to write this down. First Timothy, I think it's First Timothy chapter number 3. Is it First Timothy chapter number 3? No, let me verify that real quick here. I don't want to be giving you the wrong Scripture. But um, the Bible says in in, no, 2 Timothy, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And look at verse number, uh, look at verse number 14 there. I'm going to get to those three ingredients right after this. The Bible says in verse 14, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It goes on to say, And that from a child, Thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy was someone who was raised in the church. And then Paul told him, everybody say all. 
all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And notice what it's profitable for. The Bible says it's profitable for doctrine. Look at somebody and say, that's what you're supposed to believe. It's just that simple. Doctrine is what you're supposed to believe. And then it goes on to say for reproof or rebuke. And that's what you're not supposed to believe. And so a lot of times Jesus will rebuke us and try to help us to understand that's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how it's, you're supposed to believe it. And that's why he will reprove or rebuke us. And then the Bible says for correction and for instruction in righteousness. What I'm telling you is a true disciple of Jesus Christ will become very close to God's word. And God's word will be the thing that will help you to know what to believe, what not to believe, what needs to be corrected, and what needs to be instructed. You must understand that is a definite plan of God. Praise God. Because you want to know who was rebuking Peter? Let me remind you of this. The word that became flesh. Jesus is, was, always is the word. And so this is what we must understand when we get these ideas in our head, even though they might be good to us. We need the help of the Lord, praise God, to help us in Jesus' name. And so the Bible says there in chapter number 16 and verse number 20, 22, that, you know, that Peter began to rebuke the Lord. But in verse 23, Jesus began to rebuke Peter. And so if you're going to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, and I hope that's what you want, you're going to have to learn that sometimes the Lord is going to have to rebuke you. Sometimes he's going to have to rebuke me. And we're going to have to be willing to handle it. Praise God. There's a scripture in the book of Hebrews. I won't have you turn there, but it's very simple. The Bible says that God will chasten them whom he loves. And you must understand, you know, one of the relational relationship aspects of the kingdom of God is sonship. That he's the father and we are the son. And so this is what God wants to do, praise God. He wants to help us to understand this. But here's an important principle, and I'm going to give you three ingredients, praise God, that will help you with this. We must understand something here, folks, that we are not transformed into mature Christians overnight. You don't come to a church service and accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and all of a sudden everything is okay. No, it's a process. And that's why the big idea this week is discipleship is a process if you embrace the process which is very important you're going to have to get with the process you're going to have to quit you know shying away from the process but if you embrace the process then you're going to end up closer to Jesus than you ever have before come on I feel some desire in here right now I feel like there is a desire to get close to Jesus Christ come on are you willing to pay the price which is through the process come on why don't we again we got a few minutes why don't we lift up those hands right now and say Lord I want to embrace the process I want to do what you want me to do every day in the name of Jesus not my will but your will being done oh I feel that praise God I'm telling you right now folks there's some things that are going to be broken because of this process in the name of Jesus oh thank you Lord thank you Lord praise you Jesus hallelujah Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for people who will answer the call, that will answer the call in Jesus' name. Praise God. And so you may be seated again. The Lord bless you. And so we must understand something here, like it says on the screen. Discipleship is not a one-time event, but you must understand, but a, come on, write that down. Please write that down. Please get that in your spirit. It's not a once-a-week thing. It's not a once a month. It's not going to a church camp once a year. 
Come on, these things might encompass it, but it's a daily process. And hopefully some of us are beginning to see the revelation of that plan. Come on, I'm telling you, most of you have already received the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. But I believe there's a revelation of his plan for your life right now. Just like Peter, I got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be mistreated. There's going to be a lot of folks that are going to hate me, and I'm going to die. And Peter's saying, no, that can't be. But I'm here to tell you, folks, the process is going to take place whether you like it or not and that's why you and I must begin to we must begin to embrace the process and what is that every day every day say that with me every day every day every day counts for the Lord come on that's what I'm telling you it's not a complicated thing but it's something that has to take place every day and that's what made the difference. That's why his disciples put away their fishing nets. They put away their jobs, and they begin to daily follow Jesus Christ. This is the process that needs to be embraced. This is the big idea this week, praise God. Last week, it was the idea that the invitation is being extended, and you need to accept the invitation. This week, we need to begin to begin, we need to make a concerted effort to begin the process that I am going to begin to follow Jesus every day. And what you're going to learn, praise God, is that that's not going to bring automatic perfection to your life. But believe me, it's going to get you closer to Jesus Christ than you have ever been in your life. That's what this is all about, my friend. That's what God wants to begin to do in Jesus' name. Discipleship is not a one-time event, but a daily process. Can you say amen? Now, let's take a few minutes and let's talk about what the process is. What are we talking about here? What are we really, you know, trying to get, get into, integrated into our lives? Well, as I told you before, there's three ingredients that are going to be extremely important for this to happen. Praise God. And let me give you those ingredients one at a time. The first ingredient that you're going to have to realize and you're going to have to embrace is something called patience. The scripture tells us in the first chapter of the book of James, it says, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you enter into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then he goes on to say, let patience, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing. You know, the word patience there in the book of James means endurance. It means that you and I have to learn how to endure some hardships, that there's going to be times when we're going to want to do some things, but we know that's not according to the plan of God. And that's why patience is going to be very, very important for us to begin to develop, praise God. Patience, praise God, is one of the key elements, praise God, if I can get, okay, whatever, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. There we go, yeah, there we go, there we go. So there it is. The discipleship process includes patience. Patience is those things that you and I, you know, we sometimes pray for, and then when God brings situations into our lives where things like that can be developed, we say, well, no, 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 no. That, by the way, wasn't what I was praying for. I was praying for miracles. I was praying for instant relief. I was praying for you just to take care of everything. Come on, folks. And sometimes Jesus has to come into our life and rebuke us and help us to understand that's not how the process is done. That, you know, God could. It's like my friend up there in, in, um, um, in Malta. Could God have kept him from, from sliding off of that roof? <laughs> that was a no-brainer. Sure, God could have. But he decided not to. And I don't know all that my friend is learning, and I'm certainly not here to throw it in his face. But I'm here to tell you, I believe he's going to be a better person after this whole episode. And believe me, He's going to have to learn some patience because for the next six weeks, he can't walk. Ooh, how, how many of us would like to be put in that kind of a situation? Yeah, that one wouldn't cut it very well. What would have been our idea? Our idea would have said, well, just send one of your angels to catch him when he flies off the roof there and just set him gently down. Disney, Disney, 
Come on, God could do that. And I've heard of cases where God does things similar to that. But sometimes he chooses not to. Why? Because he knows that the discipleship process needs to take place. Patience. This is something that you and I are always going to struggle with because you and I have something within our makeup called our flesh that don't like it. And that's why the Bible says, remember the, pre remember the, the minimum requirements for becoming a disciple? What did Jesus say at the end of this chapter? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. Remember those principles? Well, I'm telling you something, folks. Patience is designed or endurance is designed to help us to be able to deny ourselves. Because again, I'm going to emphasize this again. It's not only just knowing who Jesus is. It's very important that we begin to understand his plan. And we know that his plan was to be born into this world and to live a godly life and then one day to be crucified and buried and to be resurrected, praise God. Well, you and I in similar fashion are the same way, praise God. We were born into this world and God wants to lead us into great close fellowship with him. And then, praise God, we are going to die also. But how many knows that that's not where it ends? Come on, folks, our hope is that one day we're going to be resurrected along with Jesus Christ. Come on, folks, I'm telling you, the plan of God is foolproof. But we must receive, we must embrace the plan. This is what God wants to help us to get to a place where we can do this. And this is only done, it can only be done through a daily relationship with Jesus Christ. And so patience is very, very, very important, praise God. Christ is formed in us, literally. He is formed in us, praise God, one day at a time. Ingredient number two is that we must understand and learn the art of consistency. I've made reference to this, and I'll continue to make reference to this. This is one of the things that God taught me very valuably when I first got into the church, praise God. You know, and that is the fact that discipleship process also includes consistency. What does that mean? That means getting beyond your feelings. That means getting beyond what the results are that you're seeing. And you do it anyway, praise God. Let me give you an example. I believe God has called you to a field out there. It might be a job situation right now. And that call is called to live for him consistently no matter who else doesn't in the name of Jesus. Listen to me, folks. One of the the most valuable things you can learn in the kingdom of God is when you fall, not if, when you fall, get right back up in the name of Jesus and say, okay, I'm going to do it over. I'm going to do it right this time. I'm going to let the Lord have his true way in my life in Jesus' name. Come on, I'm talking about the process now. And the big idea in this classroom or in this, in this particular week is the fact that discipleship is a process. It's not an automatic thing, praise God. And this is what you and I must learn. We must learn the art, praise God, of consistency. And I believe that God can do that. Look at the questions in your book right now. Do you consider yourself a patient person? Well, you know, write my answer down, will you? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. But you know something, folks? I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I, I, I know what God needs to do. I know he wants to do it. But I want him to do it right now. I don't know about you folks, I, I, don't, man, I can't tell you how many times I've come to the church maybe on a, on a morning when things weren't going so well and look up towards heaven and my prayer is, you know God, today would be a great day for you to come back after your church. Right now, my opinion. Let's just go ahead and take care of it right now. Anybody besides me ever prayed that kind of a prayer? Yeah, sure we do. And so, you know, we've got to understand that sometimes we are patient and I believe that you are learning. Come on, there's probably some things in your life right now that you don't get near as excited about as you used to. Come on, thank the Lord for that. Do you know what that is? That is a sign that Jesus Christ is shining through you. Come on, that's what that is. That's a sure-fired sign that Jesus is shining through you. And you need to celebrate that victory. Come on, learn not to take credit for it because we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. And so, you know, what do we, 
what is it about patience that kind of that that kind of turns our, 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 our you know puts on our buttons or pushes our buttons? This is the kind of thing that maybe God can help you through this process to begin to see. Maybe it's just fact that you know maybe you don't quite know His Word good enough. Maybe there's some parts about the Bible that you haven't been acquainted with yet. Well, I'm telling you, during this discipleship process, I believe that God can begin to give you some of those scriptural answers, and you can begin to embrace them. Another question is, why is developing patience so hard for us? Yeah. Well, I've given you one of the, one of the main key answers, in my opinion, and it's because we have a flesh. We have a flesh that is not patient. And that's just the way it is. Now, I'm not talking about a personality now, folks, because there are some people's personality and disposition that are lend itself a little more to this. But the deep-rooted thing is, is that your, pa your flesh and my flesh, no, we don't excel in this. And if enough buttons are pushed in our life, I don't care who you are. I don't care how old you are, how long you've been living for God. The old patient siren is going to go off. And so we must understand that God is trying to help us in this process. And that's why, again, the aspect of consistency is so important. As God begins to do this, accept that. Accept that. Let me remind you of the scripture in, for, in, the, in the first chapter of James again. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you enter into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But the key is, let patience have its perfect work. That means complete, by the way. That means there's a completion that God wants to bring into your life. And I believe through this discipleship process, you can begin to see that happen more consistently in your life than you ever have before. I'm telling somebody right now that maybe you've had a series of failures that God can help you to get back up he can help you to develop some patience. He can begin to, in that patience process, begin to put consistency in your life. And I'm telling you, you're going to draw closer to him than you ever have before. Come on, why don't we just lift up both of those hands right now and let's thank the Lord for what he is doing. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. The third ingredient, this is one that I want to bring to you right now, praise God. And again, all of these are very important, and it's important for us to embrace this. But it's the idea that the discipleship process also involves submission. Now, this is one that a lot of times we misunderstand, you know, because the Scripture tells us in the book of Amos that how can two walk together lest they be agreed? And so agreement is something that needs to grow in your life. I hope that there's more things that you're in agreement with God today than there were when you started, okay? But I'm going to guarantee you right now, just like myself, we don't agree with God in everything. Oh, no, we don't. And that's why submission is very important. It's because submission is very important when you don't agree with God, when you don't feel like praying, when you don't feel like opening up your Bible, when you don't feel like coming to church, when you don't feel like putting on maybe a smile or whatever the case is, submission comes in and helps us to do it anyway. We do it because we know that's what God wants us to do. Come on, folks, I'm telling you, this is one of the keys to becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ, is that we begin to say, hey, I'm not going to be in agreement with God on everything, but I'm going to be in submissive in the areas where I'm not, in the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm telling you something right now. Jesus told Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth, you shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is what God is doing for you right now. He's giving you keys to the kingdom of God. Oh, come on, folks. I'm telling you right now, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place, not just for a lesson, but for a lifetime in the name of Jesus, that God's giving us a key to the life that he wants us to live in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. And so the question that we must ask, and we're going to encounter this, believe me, as we go along, 
Believe me, this question's going to come up over and over again. How? How do we do this? How are we going to bring this about in our lives? Well, listen, folks, we could talk about all kinds of things, and maybe you need to write some things down. Maybe right now God is dealing, you with, dealing with you about a couple of ingredients that would really help the process matter. You know, I believe that God is doing that in a class like this. I believe that God, through his word, can, in, can, can specifically hone in on the areas of our life that maybe are a little bit troublesome right now. And I'm going to guarantee as a pastor, because God has helped me to see it in people's lives, and believe me, folks, it wasn't my request. God has shown me things, that a lot of things can be traced back to the fact that sometimes we just aren't submissive. The Scripture teaches us. Let me show you something here, and then, then we'll move on here. Look at James again. I know I've made reference to this book a few times here today, but let me make reference to it one more time here today. Look at James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4. And look at what it says here. I, I won't read the entire chapter here, but you could read that, and it could volumes. It talks about wars and fightings and conflicts, and it says, where do these things come from? And the bottom line is they come from us. They come from you and me. We sometimes, we bring these things into the situations. But the Bible says in verse number 6, and this is what you and I must center on sometimes. I pray this prayer on a daily basis. I try to. Lord Jesus, today I receive from you your grace, your mercy, your peace, because without you I can't do anything. That is a daily prayer of mine, and it's the truth. The Bible says, but he giveth more grace. Look at that. That means there's going to be times when we're going to have to have more of what God has given us. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. And that's why the Bible says in verse 7 there, submit. The word submit there actually comes from a Greek word that means to obey. That's what true submission is. True submission is I obey whether I want to or not. And so the Bible says, submit yourselves therefore unto God and then resist the devil or oppose him. That's what the word actually means there. It means to oppose the things of the devil. What you can't oppose the things of the devil if your flesh wants to keep doing them. And that's why you're going to have to learn the art of true submission, saying no, saying I'm not going there, I'm not doing that. Have some patience, some endurance, and then after you get some endurance, do it consistently. Do it every day in the name of Jesus. And then learn, praise God, that life is going to be one long process of at times saying no. And so this is what God can help us when it comes to the process of discipleship. Come on, you asked the question. How are we going to do this? Come on, we've gotten some of the ingredients here of how we to do this. We need to develop patience. We need to get consistent or stay consistent, and we need to submit ourselves to God. Listen to me, folks. This is not somebody being picked on. This is the process. This is the plan. This is what Jesus is not only trying to reveal who he is, but he's trying to reveal his plan. And his plan is for us to grow in his grace and in his knowledge. Can you say amen? There's a story here that I want to read you that I think can maybe help us to, oh, get an example of what we're talking about here. On August the 7th, 2012, Hunter Kemper, the guy's name was Hunter Kemper, jumped into the water for the start of a London Olympic triath triathlon. He and the other 54 contestants splashed their way down the swim course. At 36 years of age, Kemper finished a 1,500-meter swim, a 40-kilometer bike ride, and a 10-kilometer run. Let me just interpret that. That's hard. That's hard. The athletes who qualify for an Olympic team are in top physical shape. Think about that. They dedicate their lives to that cause. I'm not being critical of them. I'm just being observant. Those people are sold out for what they're doing. Okay? Boxers, wrestlers, swimmers, cyclists do not automatically get a ticket to compete simply because they are in pretty good shape. Fitness 
at the, at the Olympic level takes on a different meaning. The fittest athletes do not always get the medals, but they always have a distinct advantage. Come on, I want to stop right now. And I think somebody in this room right now is being talked to about God helping you to be in better shape than you are. And I'm not talking about hitting the rec center. I'm not talking about, you know, getting yourself a brand new pair of running shoes. I'm talking about in the spirit. I believe that God wants to help us to become a little bit more fit in the spirit. And I believe that is absolutely available to every person here today that will answer the discipleship call. Now, psycho psychologists have calculated the difference, think about this, between gold medal glory and just missing the medal stand by one half of one percent. Very small. And so you must understand the ones that actually end up with the medals, they do a whole lot more. And so for top Olympic athletes like Kimmer or Kemper, training is a six-day-a-week job. That's what they do. Hunter Kemper lives with his family in Colorado Springs, so he is able to train at high altitude. We don't even have to move to Colorado Springs to do that, do we? His daily routine, now, now think about this. His daily routine begins at 7.30 a.m. with a 500-meter swim. He chooses to swim first because, for him, it's the hardest thing to do. So he chooses to do that first. He says, after I'm tired, he says, after a break, he runs 10 to 12 miles before breaking for lunch. Now, he did all of that before lunch. After lunch, he bikes for a couple of hours, pedaling approximately 40 miles per day. Of course, somewhere in his day, he still finds time for a period of weightlifting and stretching. So beyond the science, nutrition, exercise machines, there remains a simple formula for becoming an Olympic athlete. The winning athletes are just simply willing to work harder than anyone else to reach their goal. Now listen to me, folks. You know I'm not talking about joining the Olympics. You know I'm not talking about getting yourself, you know, in, in, in tremendous physical shape, although I'm not opposed to, to, you know, to doing that at times. But I'm talking about something in a spiritual standpoint. And I believe today God has talked to us in this room. I, I, there's no question in my mind that God has put us on this course, that God has said, listen, I have a life for you that is called victory. You know, he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the kingdom of God. What that means is they're not going to win. But listen to me, folks. That means that you and I must begin to take this race a little bit more seriously sometimes than we do. And I believe that God right now is in, is in the process right now of changing some desires. I believe that's happening. I could feel it last week, and I can sense it in this place right now. Bible says, through desire, a man, you know, separating himself, intermenteleth with all wisdom and knowledge. Desire is a tremendous thing. And I'm going to tell you something right now. Maybe your desire hasn't been just perfect for the Lord, and I'm not here to, to find fault with you. I'm just here to tell you that I believe that God, who reveals himself to who he is. How many believes in the oneness of God? How many believe that Jesus Christ is God? Come on. I believe that same God is revealing a plan to you right now. And that plan is for you to win. That plan is for you to complete. That plan is for you to get to heaven. That plan is for you to have victory in this life in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you right now, that is the plan of God. But that plan is not going to be achieved easily. And that's why you and I must count the cost. You want to do yourself a good homework assignment? The 14th chapter of the book of Luke is a tremendous chapter. It talks about a lot of different things. It talks about healing. It talks about forgiveness. But one of the things it talks about in that chapter is the fact that we need to learn how to count the cost. And I'm telling you right now, discipleship has a lot to do with that. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in these lessons. But I'm here to tell you, I believe that God wants to begin that process, and he wants to begin that process now in Jesus' name.
Last week we did this. I don't know if we're going to be doing this every week. But would you do me something? Would you come out of that chair right now and come down to this altar? And let's have a little family time of prayer in Jesus' name. Come on, I believe the Lord has told and talked and said a lot of neat things during this session here. There's no question in my mind that every one of you are, were supposed to be here today. No question in my mind. But I believe we must understand, praise God, that we have brothers and sisters that are in the same race as we are, praise God. And we must learn how to pray for one another in Jesus' name. Learn how to encourage one another. I want you to understand, if you're sitting here today and maybe things aren't going quite well in your life, I'm here to tell you, folks, Jesus is for you. I'm here to tell, tell you that if things are going well in your life right now, you give God the praise and the glory. But let's begin to lift up our hands right now. And let's ask God to help us. Come on, I believe the help is here. I believe the name of the Lord is a strong tower in Jesus' name. The righteous can run in and they're safe in Jesus' name. Oh, what a, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God you and I serve. There's no question about it. He is the almighty. He is the everlasting in Jesus' name. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. That's it. Go ahead and call out to him. Call out to him right now. Listen, if you've never known what true repentance is, I'm telling you, God can teach you. He can help you in Jesus' name. If you've never been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, I would ask you to consider that. If you've never received the Holy Ghost, please learn what that is. That is something that God has for you. He is calling you into his plan, and his plan has all of the provisions that you need in Jesus' name. Come on, let's take about 30 seconds more and let's just begin to call upon the Lord. Come on, right now, you can do that. You can make up your mind that, praise God, this isn't just going to be another lesson. This isn't just going to be another Sunday morning where I go to church and I go home and forget about it. I'm going to embrace the things that God has given to me right now. I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to sit here and whine and complain as much anymore. I'm going to begin to say, hey, God, give me some patience. Help me to endure these things in Jesus' name. And then every day, help me to get up and to be willing, praise God, to follow you in Jesus' name. Help me, Lord God, when I don't agree with you, to bring true submission into the picture in Jesus' name. That's it. That's it, Lord God. I pray. I pray that blessing be upon every one of these right now in Jesus' name, and that your word will grow, your grace will grow, your mercy will grow, your ways will grow into their lives right now in Jesus' name. Name. That's it, Lord God. Help families to be healed. Help husbands and wives, Lord God, to embrace this. Help them to engage their children in the name of Jesus. Lord God, I give you the praise. I give you the glory, Lord God. You are the one, Lord God, that is willing to do all that we ask or think in the name of Jesus. Give you the praise and the glory. That's it. I feel the anointing of the Lord in this place to break every yoke. I believe the anointing of the Lord is in this place to bring it to pass in the name of Jesus. That's it, Lord God. You are the one. You are the almighty. You are the everlasting. You are the king of kings in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's take another 15 seconds. Come on, let's just lift him up in the name of Jesus. Let's give him the glory. Give him the honor in the name of Jesus. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Bless the Lord. He is the one. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. You can return to your seats. The Lord bless each and every one of you in Jesus' name. Let me just make some concluding remarks here, and then we can go on in Jesus' name, and we can have our fellowship. And the Lord bless each and every one of you in Jesus' name. One of the things that I do want to remind you of especially those of you that have young children that you brought to this church, is we want you to understand that your children are, are being engaged in this type of teaching too. And it's not like they're getting it at the level that you are, but they are getting some nuggets and they are getting some ingredients. And so you as parents, let me just encourage you, don't let this sit for a whole week. Begin to take that little booklet, and on, on the, in that booklet that you have your journal, your own personal journal, there's things that you can begin to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And let me really, really encourage you to do this. Talk to your children about this. Engage in a, in a healthy conversation about who Jesus Christ is and how he represents to you in your life. I'm telling you, you're one of the greatest influences that your child will ever have. 
I don't care how old they are. They're still influenced by you. And so this is an important aspect, praise God, that you will take these things and not just keep them within yourself, but you will begin to engage others. Those of you that maybe don't have any children, maybe you could ask the Lord to give you somebody this week that maybe you could share some of this with, that God could help you maybe to bring somebody else into the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, folks, the opportunities are unlimited in Jesus' name. And so the Lord bless you. Thank you for coming to a class like this. We're still making some adjustments, still trying to get through this, but we feel like this on the long, on the long haul is going to be something that will be extremely profitable for you in Jesus' name. Don't forget the fellowship immediately after this. I don't know how long it's going to take for the food to get to prepare back there. I know they're already back there preparing it, and so it might be just a few minutes before we'll actually start serving. Remember, this is a fundraiser dinner, and so if you can, you can give $10 uh, for the adults and, and, fi and $5 for children under 12. The Lord bless you. Don't forget our services tonight. Where does services begin on Sunday night? They actually begin on, in the prayer room on Sunday mornings, too. And so you're invited to the prayer room. The Lord bless each and every one of you in Jesus' name. If you have an offering or a tithe, you can leave it before you leave. And the Lord bless you this week in your engaging and embracing the discipleship project. The Lord bless you, folks, in Jesus' name. Be seated. Amen. God is good, isn't he? Praise God. Praise God. I'm so thankful that the Lord is, is so good and so powerful in Jesus' name. Amen. It's things like the last 35, 40 seconds, maybe two minutes or so that can make great impacts on people's lives in Jesus' name because it isn't the will of God for any to be, to be lost. It's the will of God for all to be saved. And so in services like this and times like this and environments like that, even when people came in just with the idea of just screwing around or, or fooling around, praise God, soberness can come into the place, and it just did. It, if you felt that, you could feel the Spirit of the Lord. And that wasn't condemnation, praise God. That was the hope of the Lord coming in in Jesus' name. And I'll tell you right now, nobody in this place is going to be the same again, even young and old alike. I don't care how old they are, praise God. God is dealing, and he's touching them. And I am so glad, praise God. Church, we got to give him the opportunity to do this. This is what we're all about. We're not somebody that has confidence in the flesh. We have confidence in the spirit, praise God. And so I'm glad that we can do that. We can maintain that in Jesus' name, praise God. This week, we appreciate uh, those of you that will get in, and all of you, really, but those of you that especially that will get involved in this discipleship project that we have going here at the church. Don't forget those journals that you have. Review those things on a daily basis, and you will find yourself in the process. Praise God. Why don't you turn to somebody right now and say, I'm in the process. Oh, yes, that's, that is absolutely, absolutely a, a good thing in Jesus' name, to be in the process in Jesus' name. Praise God. Look at the scripture tonight in the book of um, 1 Peter, 1 Peter, um, and I want to read out of uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5, <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter number 5, and again, thank you and welcome everybody to these, or to this service, praise God, this um, uh, coming Sunday, um, uh, Brother Fitzner and myself will be getting on a plane in the afternoon, Sunday afternoon, and flying to um, uh, um, Nashville uh, for meetings. He has meetings, I have meetings, and so um, he'll be gone most of the week. I'll be gone some of the week, and so next Sunday night we won't be having services here in the church. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday possibly, we will be streaming the uh, services from the General Conference into this place, so keep that in mind. God is good, isn't he? First, uh, First Peter chapter number 5, and verse number six is where I will begin. The scripture says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Somebody say the hand of God. Amen. Say it again. That's going to be emphasized tonight, the hand of God. Praise God. That he may exalt you in due time, raise you up. It says, casting how much? All your care upon him, for he careth for you. Lots of things you could uh, teach and preach about in, in that particular verse of Scripture, or these two verses of Scripture. Uh, but tonight I want to talk about the hand of God. What does it represent? And um, I'm going to give you some things here tonight that God wants to bring into our lives if we will allow God's hand to be on our lives. There's no question about it. Um, uh, 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 the Scripture teaches us in, in uh, Psalm 78 um, a very valuable lesson. Um, one of the benefits that you and I have is that 
we're living after the time of the nation of Israel, and, and of course, uh, because of that, we can observe their life, their lifestyle, how did they do, and that type of thing, and we can glean quite a bit from them, praise God. In fact, the Bible says that most of what was happening to the nation of Israel was written for our admonition. It was written for exampleship so that you and I could uh, understand, get some word pictures and things of that nature. Let me give you a word picture here tonight about the nation of Israel. Look at the 78th Psalm, Psalm 78. And um, uh, I'll begin reading in verse number 40. The entire uh, ch chapter deals with some of the episodes in their life, the history and how they went through it and so on and so forth. Let me just uh, grasp a few scriptures out of here, verses, so that maybe we can get some, we can get some, uh, some type of a vision here. The scripture says in verse number 40, 78, Psalm 78 and 40, it says, how oft did they provoke him? It's talking about their relationship with God. It says in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert. That's not real encouraging words, but that's what happened. There were times when they complained. There were times when they just didn't do and follow through with what God wanted them to do. Yea, they turned back and they tempted God. And he uses a word there. The Bible says, and limited the Holy One of Israel. Limited him. Praise God. Scripture goes on to say in verse 42, it says, they remembered not his hand. They forgot about the hand of the Lord. And so hopefully tonight this is something that will maybe come back to us. The hand of the Lord is upon, upon us. Praise God. Or can be. Let me put it that way. Nor the day when he delivered them from their enemy. Great escapades, tremendous es escapades that, that went through. Um, uh, odds that were just not even there, but God was t went, went with them and, and he helped them in Jesus' name. But uh, the situation at hand here is that they forgot about that. They forgot about how good God was and how powerful he was in their life. Um, verse 43, it says how he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan. Scripture goes on to say in verse number 44, it says, and had turned their rivers into blood and their floods, it says that they could not drink. So there was lots of things that God showed the nation of Israel. His hand, his hand, praise God. In fact, when he was, um, um, when he was uh, to bringing them out of the bondage of Egypt, and remember, you know, in the scripture, there's some consistent type, type, typology, if I can put it that way. And Egypt has always been kind of a type of sin. Amen. And God has to bring us out of that sin, doesn't he? Amen. Come on. God is able to do that. His hand is able to deliver in Jesus' name. How many can remember maybe a particular thing that was in your life for maybe a while, and all of a sudden, with the help of the Lord, praise God, you were delivered from that. Can you lift your hands tonight and give God praise for that? Come on. That's the way it's supposed to be, by the way. Oh, yes. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. God wants to continue to do that in your life and in my life. Praise God. But there's times when, when quite simply, we can lose track of the hand of God. And God wants to help us. You know, in the scriptures, in, in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, it, it, it gives us these episodes where God would begin to reveal himself in certain ways. And, and um, it was just un, uh, undisputable, if I can put it that way. And I believe we serve the same God today in the name of Jesus. I'm telling you, we do. We serve the same God today because he is the ruler, isn't he? Amen. You know, there are several times when God took his finger and began to write. You know, one time in particular I'm thinking of in the uh, book of Exodus where he um, began to take his finger and began to write the law on those um, uh, stones, those those uh, tablets, praise God, and, and no doubt, praise God, that must have been quite a sight to see. Amen. But even with that, you know, sometimes people would lose sight of, of, of what God was saying. And so we've got to be careful, praise God. Um, I've taught for a long time, and I'll continue to teach that I believe that what God is doing now is not so much writing things on tablets of stone, but he's writing things on our hearts. That's what he's doing. He's reminding of us of things about his word, praise God, on a daily basis if we will let him, if we won't limit the Holy One, praise God. And so uh, there's got to be some consideration of that, praise God, that we're not going to limit what God is going to do in our lives. Do you feel that way tonight? Come on, I feel like there's somebody here tonight that maybe this is just exactly what God has been reminding you of this past week. That's good. Just lift up those hands right now and say, Lord God, I receive. 
Come on, the Bible says to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Humility just means, God, your will, not my will. Praise God. Humility just says, I'm not going to be in charge. You're going to be in charge in Jesus' name. Let the Lord do that, praise God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, that's right. I, that's right. I believe that God is doing some tremendous things in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. 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 That's right. That's right. Let's let him continue to do that. Let's let him continue to write those things on our hearts. Let's not lose track of what God is doing in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Um, in the New Testament, praise God, we see there was an episode where Jesus literally stooped down. He was in the, um, in the temple, praise God, and people were, uh, things were happening. They brought someone before him that was caught in the um, aspect of sin. And, of course, the law stipulated that um, if a person was found in this kind of sin, this kind of guilt, that there was a stoning to be played, to take place. And, of course, Jesus didn't deny the law. Jesus didn't do that. He came to fulfill the law. And, of course, he made that statement. If you remember right, you know, in the 8th chapter of the book of John, he said that he that is without sin, what did he tell him to do? Go ahead and cast the stone. You know what that meant? You know what that meant? That meant that Jesus, if he wanted to, he could have picked up a stone. You think about that. Jesus himself, because Jesus was without sin. The Bible says he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. But Jesus did not. He did not pick up a stone, praise God. If you remember right, and you should follow that sometime and review that in your own mind. You know, the Bible says that Jesus, when he looked up and everybody had left or most of the people had left, you know, there it was, him and, and, and this young lady. And he said, where are thine accusers? And, and, and she, of course, said, they're not here, they're gone. And Jesus said, neither do I, con uh, you know, condemn you. But what did he tell her? Oh, come on. I'm telling you, the hand of God was there. What was he telling her? You don't need to act like that anymore. You don't need to have that kind of behavior in your life. A God came into this world to show you how much he loved you, praise God. And if you'll let his hand into your life, praise God, you'll not only feel the forgiveness of God, but you'll feel the deliverance power of the name of Jesus. I'm telling you right now, his hand is powerful. His hand is quick. His hand, praise God, is, makes things alive. Come on, I feel there's somebody in this place right now. That's what you need. You need the hand of God upon your life right now. And God is extending that hand right now. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be to the name of the Lord. Oh, blessed be to the name of the Lord in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. But sometimes we can forget about the hand of God and how he wants to do things in Jesus' name. You know, Peter wrote that, you know, uh, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Let me show you a, uh, maybe an episode or two when he forgot that, when he forgot the hand of God, praise God, and had to be reminded of that. Go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter number 18. Gospel of John, chapter number 18. And let me show you something here um, in, in Jesus' name. The Scripture says, you know, and of course this is the time when Jesus was just before his crucifixion and of course, he knew what was happening and, and so on and so forth. This morning, we talked a little bit about the fact that when Jesus began to reveal this plan to his disciples, Peter, of course, spoke up and said, be it far from thee, Lord. This is not something that he felt like Jesus should do. And, of course, the Scripture says that he was rebuking Jesus. And, of course, we understand this morning after learning from the Word that Peter, or not Peter, but Jesus turned around and rebuked Peter, didn't he? Yeah. The plan of God is important, folks. And I'll tell you something, the hand of God is what brings the plan of God into our lives in Jesus' name. And so in the 18th chapter of the book of John, this is what's happening before them. And the scripture tells us there, it says that um, when Jesus had spoke these words, he went forth, and I'm in verse number 1, 18 and 1. It says his disciples over the brook uh, 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 Cedron, it says, where was a garden? Into the which he entered and his disciples. Catch the scene. Jesus is going to spend some time with his disciples in a garden. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus, Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priest and, and, and Pharisees, cometh thither with, with lanterns and torches and, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, whom seek ye? The scripture says, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. 
Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, it says, which betrayed him stood with them. Scripture says in verse number six, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, the Bible says something here, and I've often uh, pondered this thought. The Bible says they went backwards and fell on the ground. Wow. I am he. <laughs> Come on, somebody say the hand of God. I'm telling you, the hand of God is powerful. In Jesus' name. And so here's the hand of God. Whom do you see? Jesus of Nazareth. I'm him. Wow. Well, in verse number seven, then asked he them again, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered in verse number eight, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled which he spake of them, which of thou has, or which thou gavest me, have I lost none. But watch this. The Bible says then, Simon Peter, didn't quite learn yet. The scripture says, having a sword. Got to be careful who you hand those swords to. Yeah. Praise God. The Bible says, having a sword, he drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Melchus. The Bible says, come on, Peter, that's not the hand of God. Let me show you the hand of God. The scripture says, then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the, and the captives and a captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. Praise God. What you have to do is go to the book of Matthew, chapter number 26, where you'll find that, you know what Jesus did? Come on, we're talking about the hand of God here. He reached down and picked up that ear. Personally, I think that what Peter was looking to do is cut the guy's head off. Yeah. You know, that's what we say the hand of God is sometimes, isn't it? And what did Jesus do? He picked up that ear and put it on the side of that servant, and he healed that man. I'm telling you, even in the midst of his enemies, praise God, even in the midst of people that wanted to put him to death, praise God, Jesus allowed the hand of God to be revealed in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, the hand of God is powerful. Come on, let's go back to our original scripture tonight. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Come on, somebody ready to let the hand of God move in your life? In the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest things that you can do. Oh, man, I feel the Holy Ghost ministering right now. I'm telling you, you can lift your hand up right now, and you can begin to ask, and you shall, you shall receive, you shall seek, and you're going to find. You shall knock, and it's going to be opened up to you. I'm telling you right now, in the name of Jesus. Oh, I feel a flood right now, a flood coming into this place. It's called the hand of God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm just going to pause for a few minutes right now because I believe the hand of God wants to get a hold of somebody right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You got something in your life that needs to go? Let the hand of God touch you. Praise God. You got some situations in your life that need to be changed? Come on, let the hand of God come into your life right now and begin to touch you in the name of Jesus. Need a renewing? in the Holy Ghost. Come on, let the hand of God just come down and touch you right now. Oh, in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, the hand of God is not slack. It's not that he doesn't have any power. I'm telling you, he's still reaching for us in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed be to the name of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm just going to hesitate for another, just maybe another 30 seconds, because the hand of the Lord is in this place right now. Come on, if you can recognize that, and you can receive that, if you can just reach out, praise God, reach out and grab the hand of God. Oh, hallelujah, anything is possible. All things are possible. Oh, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the hand of God in Jesus' name. Oh, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. 
Oh, hallelujah. There's been some beautiful apostolic ministry in this place since we started this ministry. I'm just going to hesitate for another minute and just let it take its place. Just let it come upon, folks. Oh, hallelujah. God can do things a whole lot better than any of us. Humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. That's what we're doing right now. That's what we're claiming. We're not going to have any confidence in the flesh, but our confidence is in the Lord. Our confidence is in Him, what He can do. That's right. That's right. Come on. You feel that building right now? That's the hand of God. That's what he's doing. He's come into this place to demonstrate himself powerful. Oh, yes, he has. Oh, yes, he has. Oh, my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Yes, in the name of Jesus, the hand of God, the hand of God. Oh, hallelujah, praise God. It is a beautiful answer, my friend. It's something that can get a hold of anybody. It can even get a hold of children in Jesus' name. I believe that, praise God. The hand of God can get a hold of children in Jesus' name, praise God. Let me give you this last example of this, and I, I got pages full of this stuff, but God, the hand of God is better. <laughs> is a whole lot better than me, I, and I appreciate that. I really do. Um, and as I told you before, you know, there's the nation of Israel has had limited the hand of God at times in their life. And, and you think that they would learn, and sometimes they did. And God would have to send prophets onto the scene to remind them of this. One of those, uh, uh, or one such situation is found in the book of Kings. Anybody know uh, or ever heard of a prophet named Elijah? Remember him? Praise God, came onto the scene, and the Bible teaches us that it was uh, God's time to get their attention. And so what he did was he, he literally um, uh, shut off the rain in the land. And this was something that was prophesied even before this. It was prophesied during the reign of uh, Solomon, amen, that God said, if I shut up the heaven, there's something wrong, you know, and you better seek my face. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves, come on. Yes, turn from their wicked ways and seek his face. Bible says then he would, he would, and he would heal their land and forgive their sin. Come on, we're talking the same God. We're talking about the hand of God. And so during the prophet of, of Elijah, that's what would happen. That literally is what happened. They had turned to a false God, and God, you know, not willing that any should perish, will go to the nth degree to try to get a hold of people. He will, folks. I feel like we're living in the midst of a nation like that right now. Literally, folks, I'm feeling like the nation of, of the United States, and I'm not anti-American, but I feel like as a whole, we've rejected God. And God is shutting some things off. And I believe it's up to the apostolic church to keep on interceding and praying in Jesus' name. We can't demand God. You know, in our class today, you know, one of the things that was brought out about praying for people is that we can't expect God's favor to be on somebody, you know, that isn't, that isn't displaying that favor. And so we have to be careful, praise God. But I do believe that God is trying to reach and still is reaching for people. And such was the case during Elijah's time. But you know, it took three and a half years. Think about that. You know, it didn't have to be that long, but it took that long. And all of a sudden, God said, now it's time. And you remember that in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings? You remember how that, the, the commandment went forth from the prophet? Let's all come to church. And I believe that's a good idea yet. I really do. One of the things I prayed for this morning, and I felt the Holy Ghost when I prayed, was the fact for backsliders and for cold in heart and for people who had made some wrong turns in this community, praise God, that God would help them to come back in Jesus' name. Folks, that's the will of God in my opinion. Amen. If it takes three and a half years, so be it. I want to see the hand of God come in their lives again and again and again. Yes, that's what I want to see. Praise God. I won't belabor this, but you know how the sacrifice was set up and the false prophets were given, you know, the, the courtesy of going first. Praise God. And, of course, they were hollering and doing all kinds of things. But did you see the hand of God? No, wasn't there. Amen. That's what I'm talking about, folks. You know, one of the things that Elijah said is let's find out who the real one is. The God that answers by fire. He's God. And, of course, everybody was in agreement. And you know how Elijah set up the, the sacrifice and, 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 and put no doubt in anybody's mind by drenching it with 12 barrels of water. 
Listen to me, folks. There was no way, no way that the fire was going to be able to come from heaven and take that out without the hand of God. And I believe God will still do things like this. And so you understand that some, I think it was like a 60-word prayer or something like that, 63 words, I believe it was, that Elijah prayed in our King James Version language, but the fire of God came down. And I mean to tell you, folks, that must have been quite a demonstration. But this is what I want to show you, praise God. The Bible says in verse number, oh, let me begin reading in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse number 41. Now, this is after that episode. I want to show you something here. 1 Kings 18 and 41. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Because you must understand, up to this time, it hadn't rained for three and a half years. And so the Bible says, So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, the mountain. And he cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, he said, go up now, look towards the sea. Come on, most of us are not um, uh, oblivious to the fact that if it's going to rain, there's going to have to be some clouds, right? And the Bible says, and he went up and he looked and he said, there's nothing. And the Bible says, he said, go again. Good advice. And the Bible says, seven times. You know, again, I told you that there's some typology in the Bible that's consistent, praise God. Egypt, when it's mentioned a lot of times, is talking about sinfulness or a sinful um, uh, lifestyle. Well, the, word, the number seven is significant, too, because in a lot of instances, seven is complete. Praise God. And so I don't believe that God just pulls these things out of a hat. And the Bible says, look at verse seven, uh, 44. The scripture says, and it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold. It's got my attention. How about yours? Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea. But what does it look like? Come on, folks. I'm here to tell you tonight, you can begin to recognize the hand of God in your life again in Jesus' name. And it might not look very big at first. And so the scripture says, he said, go up and say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And so what you must understand is that Eli or, or Ahab climbed in his 19 or 2015 Mini Cooper S. He climbed in his, his 2015, um, what's another hot car? Corvette. No, they didn't have those kind of cars back then. But probably if they did, he might have had one. No, he climbed in the best thing they had, and that was his chariot. And the Bible says, you know, it, it, um, that um, it came to pass in verse 45, it says, in the meanwhile, that the heavens was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode, he was in his chariot, and went to Jezreel. But look at verse 46. But the hand of God. Come on, somebody here, you're just worried about the wrong thing. You're worried about how it's going to come to pass. I'm here to tell you, the hand of God comes upon you, just like it came upon Elijah. The Bible says he girded up his loins and he ran before Ahab. Now, you must understand, from Carmel to Jezreel, that's not just a trip around the block. That's 20 miles. 20 miles. And that'd be a hard enough trip if you were in a chariot. But listen to me, the hand of God came upon Elijah. And I don't know exactly how old he was at this time, but I'm here to tell you when the hand of God came upon him, he was able to outrun the greatest, you know, the great, one of the greatest vehicles that was at that time. I'm here to tell you, folks, that's why we need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God of God. That's what he wants us to get into practice of doing. 
I'm telling you, my friends, the hand of God is in this place right now. And I'm here to encourage somebody. If you need something from the Lord, the hand of God is here to be put upon you. And it's going to look maybe like a little cloud in the sky, but I'm here to tell you it's able to produce some things. Come on, I feel faith in this house right now. I feel like somebody can rise up right now and you can allow the hand of God to come on your life in the name of Jesus. Come on, we don't need to worry. We don't need to fret. We don't need to be worried about what's happening in the name of Jesus. Come on, we just need to accept the fact that he can do it. Oh, in the name of Jesus, he can do it. He can do it in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I'm telling you, the hand of God can do anything. The hand of God can do everything. Oh, in the name of Jesus, you have a need right now? Come on, why don't you just put that, put your hand in the hand of him that can do anything in the name of Jesus. I feel the healing power of God right now. I feel the name of Jesus. I come against a cancer right now. I come against a, a heart disease in Jesus name right now in the name of Jesus by the hand of God I come upon that right now in the name of Jesus come on a financial need right now I come upon that with the hand of God in Jesus name oh yes direction whatever it is in the name of Jesus come on if you're serious about this you can come down to this altar tonight you can lift up those hands right now you can say yes Lord God I want your hand upon my life come on I believe the Lord's going to do this right now, right now in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, no hesitating, no unbelief, no doubt in Jesus' name. We just come, Lord God, believing in your hand tonight in the name of Jesus. That's it, that's it, that's it. The scripture says to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt us in due time. He will lift us up. He knows how to do it. He knows where to do it. He knows when to do it in the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. Begin to call upon his name. Begin to call upon the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteousness of God will be from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it. That's it. That's it. Come on. There's somebody around you that needs some help right now. Why don't you go ahead, if it's the will of God, go ahead and lay your hands on them right now. Come on. Let's pray together right now. Let's let the hand of God touch everyone. Come on, if you need the Holy Ghost, if you need to be baptized in Jesus' name, if you need a deeper repentance in your life, come on, the hand of God is upon you right now, right now, in the name of Jesus. I claim it, Lord God. I claim the promises. Oh, yes, I claim those promises right now. I claim those promises. That's right. You've come to the right place. The hand of God is in this room. The hand of God is upon our lives. That's right. He's going to strengthen. He's going to do. He's going to be there. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Come on. We can trust him. We can trust the Lord with all of our heart. We don't have to lean upon our own understanding. We can believe him. We can believe his ways. Come on. I'm telling you right now. I come against addictions. I come against vices. I come against vexations. I come against torments. I come against these things. I command them in the name of Jesus to let loose. In Jesus' name, I do. I speak that word of faith that is nigh unto my lips. In Jesus' name, that's it. That's it. Come on, I'm telling you, the hand of God is in this place. The hand of God is upon your life. That's it. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. The word of the Lord, it's prevalent in Jesus' name. That's right. We don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. Come on. I'll tell you, the Lord is good. The Lord is powerful in the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. Come on. Let's keep calling upon the Lord right now. Let's give it a few more minutes. I'm telling you, even right now, the hand of God is upon you in the name of Jesus. That's it. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, yes. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, with the help of God, we can outrun anything. With the help of God, we can get there before anything. In the name of Jesus, let's believe in those miracles. Let's believe in that power of God. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Hallelujah, Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just before you leave now, before you leave this altar area, praise God. We, we had a prophecy that went forth in the prayer room here a few weeks ago, and I thank God for prophecy. And what that prophecy really came down to was that somebody was fixing to make a big mistake. Now, we've understood that, that that's, uh, and, and that's come to pass, and the brother and I talked about it today, and, and I agree with him. But I believe it was more for, than for that one family, brother. I believe there's some folks in here that without the hand of God on your life, you're fixing to make some mistakes. And it might be an honest mistake, but boy, it can cost you. It can put you into a tailspin in Jesus' name. And I feel the, the hand of God is in this place to help you to recognize, praise God, to recognize what is the wrong direction, what is the wrong way in Jesus' name. I want us to begin to pray right now. I'm going to pray against spiritual darkness. I'm going to command it to leave each one of your lives in Jesus' name and to stay gone in Jesus' name. Lord God, I'm praying that. I pray that right now in Jesus' name. Lord God, that you can help these people. They're good people. They want to serve you. They want to see you be be the leader of their homes in Jesus name now Lord God put that anointing upon them right now that will recognize your hand that will recognize what you want to do in Jesus name Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Come on. I'm telling you right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he is here. He is here to help in those situations right now in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. I'm telling you right now, right now, the hand of God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yes, yes, that's it, that's it, that's it. Come on, I tell you, I come against that spiritual darkness in high places in Jesus' name. I come against that in Jesus' name. Yes, yes, come on, somebody needs to let the Holy Ghost flow through them right now. Come on, I'm telling you, it's here. Oh, yes. Yes, in the name of Jesus. That's it. That's it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I come against that, Lord God, in Jesus' name. I command it to let loose in Jesus' name. You said these signs would follow them that believe. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. I take that for face value. That is your hand, Lord God. In your name, we shall, we shall cast out devils. In the name of Jesus, your word will confirm in Jesus' name. Praise God. One more time, if it's proper, go ahead and put your hand on the person next to you right now. And let's pray one for another again. Let's pray for one another in Jesus' name. Come on, let's pray that the hand of God will come upon us on a regular basis. Come on, there you go, there you go. In the name of Jesus. No reason why not. No reason why not in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, that's it. That's it. Hallelujah. Clear wisdom, understanding, knowledge, Lord God, that comes and proceeds from the throne room of grace. Oh, hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's thank the Lord together. Can we do that? Jesus' name. Praise God. The Lord bless you, folks. Don't forget the hand of God is powerful. It can do anything in Jesus' name. We're going to go ahead and, and dismiss the service. Praise God. Did you have something you wanted to say? We can. What's the family's name? And what is, what are their, what's the name? Block, B L O C K, block, okay? And they've had something bad happen to them. They had uh, someone pass away, that type of thing. 
Okay. Well, let's ask God to touch that family. In fact, why don't you two grab hands right now, and you begin to pray right now for that family. Come on, lift up your voice right now. Let the name of the Lord come through you, and the rest of us will join you. That's right, the Block family. In Jesus' name, that's it. That's it. Pray for them. That's the will of God. The will of God in Jesus' name. Yes. Lord God, you know this situation. You know the tragedy. You know what it takes. Let your hand be upon their lives. Let somebody here be used, Lord God, in leading to the grace of God in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be to the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, that's right, that's right. I trust you, Lord. Mm, hallelujah, hallelujah. That's right, you're doing good, guys. Come on, pray. Ask God to touch them. Ask God to minister to them. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it. Let the hand of God come upon you for that. Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, yes. Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. He's not done yet, boys. Come on, he's using you right now. Go ahead and intercede for a few minutes. That's right, God's touching them right now as you pray. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, boys. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Praise God. Let the hand of God come upon you. And who knows what's going to happen. Anything can happen in Jesus' name. Praise God. If you want to, Sister Carnahan and I, we have some pictures from our trip from, uh, from uh, Alaska. And she's got them on a disc. And she's willing to put them up here on the screen. I didn't want to take up any of our service time with this, but if you want to stay and you want to look at some of these pictures, you're sure welcome to do that. Uh, she's going to be coming out here in just a second. She's in the nursery right now. And also what we did was we brought back um, uh, some gifts for you. And we have some things that are Alaskan um, things, you know, and uh, so hopefully you can take one of these gifts and take it home, and it'll remind you of the trip that Sister Carnahan and I took, and it will give you a little bit of a taste of, of, of Alaska in Jesus name if somebody would, wouldn't mind uh, doing me a favor and going and getting my wife right now and having her to come she can go ahead and get that if those of you that need to leave if you need to go and you don't want to stay that's, that's perfectly okay with me um, I've never been one for home movies either but, uh, but these are pre pretty pictures and I think you would appreciate them there's some beautiful scenery that we saw up there and we just wanted to share it with you and so we're going to take a few minutes. I'm not sure how long this will take her to do that. 